Citing the moribund Muslim millennium as a warning for what might happen to the West should it too succumb to religious fundamentalism, Neil deGrasse Tyson questions. Not why 85% of the National Academy rejects God. I want to know why 15% don't. But in the case of Islam, there is no causal link between belief in God and bad science or no science. The Muslims doing science during their golden age were for the most part very observant and devout. Their Iman actually inspired their scientific investigations in the first place. Harris acknowledges this, but suggests it is a bad thing, as it meant that medieval era Muslims handcuffed their efforts, restricting their scientific investigations only to the degree that they served their spiritual needs. As a consequence, Harris implies, the Muslims failed to bequeath a much larger la guest for humanity than they could have and should have. Although, if one of Harris's endorsees is to be believed, even when Muslims were doing science, their Islam didn't have anything to do with it. What's really bizarre about the Islamic religion is that at one point in time, you know, in the early, you know, it's like the 1200s and before, Islam yeah. was at the forefront of science and philosophy and writing. I mean, there, it was one of the Islamic world, the Muslim world, was one of the more advanced cultures on earth. Yeah. And it wasn't really, again, this this is where we make that distinction between Islam, the religion, and the Muslims followed it. And it's, a lot of this was done by the Mutazilites, which was a very sort of uh, open-minded, um, very progressive sect of uh, Muslims. You know, and a, so a lot of those things happened not because of Islam, but despite it. You know? Even and back it, then? Yeah, even back then. It's always been like that. I mean, Newton was a religious Christian. He was a religious Christian, but we don't identify his achievements as Christian achievements. Right, I see you what know? you're saying. We don't Typical. Like, um, the one time Rogan tries to say something nice about Islam, his guest, Ali Rizvi, isn't having any of it. If Muslims did good science, Rizvi cautioned Rogan, it was not because of Islam, but despite it. We've met Rizvi previously, but you might not have recognized him due to the poor lighting. I think I think Shia right. the Shia came out of the Mutazilites historically. Yeah. In fact, do you know? Uh, uh, Separation of Muslims from their Islam seems to be a theme with Rizvi. It's how he essentializes himself, how he self-identifies as an atheist Muslim. Note the customary Dawkinsian endorsement on the sleeve of his autobiography, and if you're not done rolling your eyes, check out the backside for more of the usual suspects. Of course. This atheist Muslim appellation is as nonsensical as the meat-eating vegetarian or the celibate sex worker, the living corpse, the four-sided triangle, the circular square thing. You get the point. Rizvi's reasoning is that although he has apostatized from Islam, the religion, he remains affiliated with Pakistani culture, which he shares with the majority of his fellow Pakistanis who happen to be Muslim. While this rationale might appear nuanced at first glance, the logical conclusion of Rizvi's cultural Muslim washing is that non-Muslim minorities have no intrinsic value other than what can be expressed through their imagined Muslimness. So we should no longer speak of millions of Christian Pakistanis and Hindu Pakistanis. There are only Christian Muslims and Hindu Muslims now. Also, I'm not sure an atheist bringing Isaac Newton into the equation helps his cause. By some measures, Isaac Newton is the greatest scientist to have ever lived. His Principia Mathematica is regarded by many as the greatest scientific work ever written. Its physics is still taught in classrooms and used in engineering today. It is clear from Newton's own words that it was monotheism, his belief in one God, which drove his scientific genius. Newton had decided to search far beyond the narrow boundaries of the classical teachings for new truths about the universe. He devoured the philosophy of the fashionable French scholar René Descartes. In the early 17th century, Descartes depicted the universe as a giant clockwork machine, created by God, but then left to run. At home during the plague years of 1665 and 1666, Newton had been intrigued by Descartes' mechanical philosophy. but he was suspicious of it. 
There was no role for God after the creation of the universe. Whence is it that nature does nothing in vain? And whence arises all that order and beauty which we see in the world? Does it not appear from phenomena that there is a being, incorporeal, living, intelligent, omnipresent, who, in infinite space, as it were, in his sensory, sees the things themselves intimately and thoroughly perceives them and comprehends them wholly? This virtual recluse drove himself to test Descartes' theory. Was the universe really a mass of lifeless matter or a living world run by God? He became fascinated by the force that held the moon in orbit and caused apples to fall. Surely gravity was the divine force, not a matter of chance. Newton was obsessive. In 18 months, he became the greatest mathematician in the world and invented calculus that enabled him to study the movements of planets in later years. For Newton, religion and science were inseparable, two parts of the same lifelong quest to understand the universe. Newton himself wanted to design a universe in which God was absolutely present and absolutely powerful. There's an enormous irony there. In the 18th century, gangs of interpreters, most of them French, will take the God out of Newton's world. It's a very common image of what the Newtonian world was, that it was soulless, that it was mechanical, that it really wasn't theologically motivated at all. Now, ironically, that's very anti-Newtonian, because Newton argued that God had to be present. You couldn't read him out of the universe. The most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And I'm not sure that it's accurate to describe Newton as a Christian, as Rizvi and Rogan do. Newton did believe in Jesus, but as a prophet, the way Muslims do, not as the divine incarnation of God. He researched the history of Christianity and became convinced that both the Catholic and the Anglican Church were founded on a corruption of the Word of God. Now, because Newton was so convinced that God is extremely powerful and unique, Newton, as the, as the saying goes, reads himself into heresy. In other words, Newton begins to minimize, to play down, eventually to deny the divinity of Christ. And Newton comes to the conclusion very early on that the Trinity is a blasphemy on the first commandment because the first commandment says that thou shall have no other gods before me and the worship of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost from Newton's point of view is a heresy. So by the early 1670s, Newton had become a secret heretic. He was convinced the doctrine of the Trinity to which Henry VIII had dedicated Trinity College was a form of blasphemy. As to Rizvi's claim that Muslims during their golden age did science not because of Islam but despite it. This is refuted by every single mission statement of the scientists themselves. Even Rizvi's claim that the science that Muslims did do a lot of this was done by the Mutazilites is just plain false. There were a few Mutazilite scientists but they were greatly outnumbered by their Sunni counterparts. Remember, the Mutazilites only held power for 34 years. Muslims did science before their appearance and continued after their demise. And it could be argued, the Mutazilite scientists' contributions were generally weaker and less empirical, that is, less scientific and more speculative than the contributions of their Sunni counterparts. If we're feeling charitable, we can mention one notable Mutazilite scholar to help Rizvi out a bit. Al-Jahid is often cited as having theorized Lamarckian evolution around a thousand years before the French biologist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck himself. But unfortunately for Rizvi, the same example undermines his main claim that Muslims did science in spite of Islam. As one German academic noted, the goal of Jahid's zoological treatise, Kitab al-Hayawan, the Book of Animals, was, quote, not actually the study of animal species, 
for a proof of the existence of the Creator that is evident from His creation. End quote. Jahid was less interested in the natural mechanisms by which life became diverse over time than he was in understanding nature in the context of monotheistic philosophy. He was a gifted philosopher and theologian interested in biology, not vice versa. And true to Mutazilite form, some of Jahid's better bits appear to have been plagiarized from Aristotle anyway. Point is, like Newton centuries later, Muslims were driven to do science by their faith, by their monotheism, their tawhid, even the heterodox of them. Dr. Muhammad Abdus Salam, the first Muslim Nobel laureate, left his listeners in no doubt as to how Islam drove his scientific inquiry. He even quoted the Quran in his acceptance speech for the 1979 Nobel Prize in Physics. الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت أرجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم أرجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير He who has created the seven heavens one above the other you can see no fault in the creations of the most merciful. Then look again. Can you see any rifts? Then look again and yet again. Your sight will return to you in a state of humiliation, worn out. This, in effect, commented Abdus Salam, is the faith of all physicists. The deeper we seek, the more is our wonder excited. The more is the dazzlement for our gaze. I would never have started to work on this subject if I, if I was not a Muslim, if I had not believed in Tawheed. If you are a particle physicist, you would like to have just one fundamental force and not four. That's the real unity between the forces. If you are a Muslim particle physicist, of course you believe in this very, very strongly, because unity is an idea which is very attractive to you culturally. But uh, if you are not a Muslim uh, fundamental for particle physicist, then uh, you may or may not believe this. This is the reason why we have scored over others in that sense. Sunni, Mutazili, Ahmadi, or otherwise, the overwhelming majority of Muslims who have been recognized for their scientific achievements have plainly stated that their science emanated from their Islam regardless of how warped an understanding of Islam they may have actually had. Their very inspiration and their intention were the very pillars of Islam. <laughs>